As most, most of you know, Ron Halbrook is with us for our gospel meeting, and the subject matter tonight will be back to the Bible. We are here tonight to study the most beloved book in the world and the most hated book in the world. God gave the Bible to guide us to heaven. And yet wicked men have made dedicated, concerted efforts to remove the Bible from the face of the earth. And as the song just said, martyr's blood stains these pages. People literally had to die so that you and I hold the Bible in our hands tonight. Amen. In my study of the history of the Bible, one of the simple accounts that came across that burned into my memory in England during the years when the Bible was first being circulated among men again, a teenager in an apprentice program, meaning he hardly had any money at all, and he slept on straw in a small room, and he scraped his money together and bought a Bible. And the man he was training under found that Bible when the young man was laid down to sleep, and grabbed him by the hair and jerked him up, and took that Bible away from him. And I just take it for granted I can pick up my Bible and study any time. And we sometimes don't realize and appreciate the human suffering that has passed that book down to us. And so we're thankful tonight that you're here because you are interested in studying the Bible. And I have to say, I want to commend there's so many young people each night that are coming and are very attentive to the Word of God. As mentioned, we always are thankful when visitors can be with us. Thank you. And thank you for your hospitality and encouragement as we go along through the week. Appreciate John and Lauren providing a supper last night. And we were taken by our host all the way to Mayberry for our <coughs> meal today. So thank you for your consideration. <coughs> After the study, we will take a few moments and open the floor to questions. And our visitors and members as well, I want you to feel free that you can participate in that part of our study. Now our theme tonight is going to be back to the Bible. And if you have a Bible, let's open to John 17, verses 17 to 21. In this passage, Jesus is approaching the time he will be crucified. And he offered up a prayer to God, the Father, for all people that they might know the truth. He was praying that prayer in the behalf of our salvation. And he prayed that we might not only be saved, but be united in him as the people of God. In John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now Jesus has been training the apostles for three years. And this prayer is that God will now set them apart to their special mission because he will be going back to heaven. And they will be sanctified through the truth Jesus taught them. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So Jesus had set himself apart to the work he came to do. Now the apostles are set apart to continue this work. But verse 20 said, Neither pray I for these alone, the apostles, but for them which shall believe on me through their word. So pay attention, he's praying for you and me. Literally. The people who will hear the gospel through the apostolic word, and he prayed, verse 21, that they may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that we may be united with God and with each other, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. There's great power when people not only obey the gospel, but love and serve each other and are dedicated to spreading the gospel to the world. So I want us to think about this passage and the implications of it tonight. 
Jesus said, Thy word is truth. And this is the only power that God has given in this world to save us from our sins. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when it does save us, it unites us with God and with each other. And it sets us apart to the great work of calling others to salvation. And again, I commend this church that you have not lost that focus. And even this week is evidence that you're striving to do that. <coughs> now, I want to analyze the expression before we go on into the study. What do you mean, back to the Bible? <coughs> what we mean is that the Bible is the only source of God's truth. The only source that will save us. Now, there are people that say, well, wait a minute, time out here, preacher. That sounds like legalism. Maybe you've heard the expression, legalism. Legalism is when I'm self-righteous. I set up a standard and I prove myself right because I set up my standard and I think I met my standard. Or I might claim perfection, even believing that the Bible is the Word of God, and that I don't sin. Now, other people sin, but not me. Now, that's legalism, and we're not talking about that. But the Bible reveals the grace of God and it is through going back to the Bible we go back to the grace of God and stay in the Bible, you stay in the grace of God. It's not legalism. Don't be scared by that expression. Now another expression somebody has coined from the word idolatry. Oh, be careful preacher, sounds like you're talking about now bibliolatry, meaning to worship this book. We're not talking about worshiping this book tonight. This book is not some kind of icon or symbol that you're going to worship. What we're driving at is this. God is the source of all truth. But how does God give that truth? Does he send an angel down on a cloud and the angel runs around the world telling us the truth? No, he doesn't do it that way. The God who is the source of the truth is the one who gave this Bible. So we're not trying to worship the Bible. We're learning to worship the God who gave the Bible. Does that make sense? Back to the Bible is back to God who gave the Bible. Back to His guidance, His instruction, His way of salvation. Because it is found exclusively in the Bible. Now we know that the Godhead includes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Christ is also God. And He had a unique role in bringing the truth into the world. He also is the source of truth. And let's read in John chapter 1, familiar but powerful passage. And let's think about why Jesus is called the Word. When you speak, your words tell a lot about who you are, what you stand for. Jesus came as the Word, meaning He embodies the will of God, the plan of God, the purpose of God. He expressed God's will in its fullness for our salvation. So in the beginning was the Word, the one who expresses the fullness of God. The Word was with God. So there are two persons in the Godhead in that verse. And the Word was God. This man called Jesus was literally God. Now go down to verse 14 through 18. He came in the flesh, the same flesh that you and I have, and he came to fully reveal God's person and God's will for our salvation. Verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes, he is the fullness of grace and truth. He's God. John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This is he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness, the fullness of Christ, he's God. Of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. It is through Christ that we will know the abounding grace of God. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. 
And that last verse makes a lot of sense. No way that we can travel up into the heavens to know God. But what about if someone who is God came down to us in the flesh and declared God to us? We have the fullness of God's grace and God's truth. Everything we need to save our soul was given through Christ and preserved in the Bible. So we're calling men back to the Bible. And I want to make three points in our study. All sin and all error constitute a rejection of God and His truth. I want you to think about this. Christ came to restore sinners back to God. We get entangled in sin and error, and Christ calls us back to God. And last, we want to talk about what it means to go back to God and to His truth. All right, first, all sin and error constitute a rejection of God and His truth. And maybe the simplest way that we can show that lesson is to go back to Genesis chapter 3. To violate the Word of God is to violate and reject God Himself. You remember in Genesis 3, 4, and 6 how that Satan comes before Eve and convinces her, and she convinced Adam to violate the word of God. Let's see how it happened. Genesis 3, verse 4. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. And as you know, God said there was a certain tree they were forbidden to eat, and if they did, you will surely die. So immediately, in verse 4, Satan is trying to convince Eve to reject the word of God. You see that? Now look at the next verse. God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The forbidden fruit will bring the greatest blessing you've ever known. Now that's another lie, and that's a rejection of God's truth, and in rejecting God's truth, it's a rejection of God Himself. Woman saw the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to her eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, and she took the fruit of it and did eat, gave it to her husband with her, and he did eat. So what happened here? She was convinced to obey Satan rather than God. Satan convinced her to follow her selfish desire rather than God. And so what is the bottom line here? She has been convinced to reject God himself. Rejecting the Word of God is a rejection of God Himself. Now then, who would do such a horrible thing? Why, who in the world would do such a horrible thing? When I look in the mirror, I will answer that question. Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As we violate the Word of God, we insult God. We do not realize what we're doing, really, because we're declaring war on God. The God who created everything. We're rejecting Him. And in so doing, we do not bring harm to God. We destroy ourselves. We were created to live in a beautiful fellowship with God, and that's all gone when we sin. Now, both religious and moral error constitute a violation of God's Word. Some sins involve religious error, some involve moral and ethical errors, but it's all a violation of the Word of God. Satan convinces us to exchange the truth for lies. And let's read that in Romans 1, 24-25. We certainly saw that in the case of Adam and Eve, but all have sinned, and it's not limited to Adam and Eve. So Romans 1 now, 24 to 25. He's looking back, sort of an overview of history past, leading up to this time when he wrote this. Paul said, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So this is men falling into the sin of immorality. Fornication, adultery, homosexuality, 
sins of this kind, moral sins. Look now, verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. In order to relieve their own conscience, in order to provide approval for their sins, their moral sins, they fell into religious error by creating concepts of God and idols that will permit them to follow their sins. So both in a moral context and in a religious context, Satan convinces people to change the truth that God has given into lies, things that God does not teach, things that violate what God teaches. So this is the sad and the sorry story of the history of man. It's the history of falling into sin and rejecting God and His Word. And we're all guilty. Christ came to restore sinners to God. The word gospel is so appropriate. It means there is good news. Think how that He died on the cross to reconcile us back to God. Now that word reconcile is an important word. It's used several times. For instance, Colossians 1 21, 22. A passage that when I read it, it just kind of, kind of sends a ripple down my backbone. Colossians 1, 21 says, And you, who were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Stop just a minute. Did I just read the word enemy? Meaning enemy of God? That is what I read. All of us, myself included, have a thousand ways to rationalize our sins. I'm not a mass murderer. I'm not such a bad person. But my sins make me the enemy of God. I may not be a mass murderer, but whatever my sins are, I am declaring war on God. And it can lead to such extremes as being a mass murderer. I don't know what I might do if I continue the course of sin. But any sin makes me the enemy of God, a fearful thing to say. Yet now have he, what is that next word? Beautiful word, reconciled. How can it be that God would ever want me to be his friend? And what would want to bring me back? But he does, and he did, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Here I am, a filthy sinner, the enemy of God, and He will clean me up through the blood of Christ and make me holy and unblameable in His sight. What a beautiful, and yet what a shocking declaration that is. Now how do we fall into sin and error? How did you fall into it? How did I fall into it? We learn it from others. We learn moral sins, ethical sins, from the practice of others, we learn religious error from the practice of those who were before us. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19 is making the point that we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ and not with silver and gold. But look what it said we're redeemed from. From your vain conversation, vain meaning empty, useless, destructive, vain, and this conversation, I'm using King James Version, that's an old English word that means the manner of my life. So the manner of our life was empty and useless, destructive, but look at the next part. Where did we learn to do all of that? Received by tradition from your fathers. Well, it's just natural that we learn things from those that went before us. And I'll make this personal in a shameful way, I can well remember when I was a young teenager and the older boys would curse, so I was going to curse too, so I would be big like them. Where did I learn to curse? I didn't invent it, but I sure learned it. I sure followed it. And it was shameful and disgusting, and it was a rejection of God. But we learned it from those before us. And rather than holding to everything that somebody has passed down to us, we need to learn to take the Bible and examine those things. And we learn good things from those before us too. I know that. 
But you've got to separate. You don't just follow something because, oh, that's the way we've always done it in my family. Or that's the way we've always done it in the United States. We need to open our Bible and find out what's right. Now, what does it mean in a practical way? Let's go to application. It's great to say, let's go back to the Bible. We all shake hands and agree. But what does it mean to do that? How do I go back to the Bible, to God and His truth? Number one, back to God's plan of salvation. Back to God's plan. Ephesians 1, 3 to 4. Our great and loving God, out of His own love and mercy and grace and compassion for us, prepared the plan of salvation in Christ. Beautiful passage. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ, in heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us in Him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. That's amazing. God even prepared that plan before He created the universe, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. So what we need to do is open the Bible and search for that plan of God that was prepared before the world began. It's in the Bible. And one of the things, of course, we would learn is John 3.16, how that God provided the perfect sacrifice for our sins. For God so loved that so is emphatic. He loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son and the giving of the Son doesn't mean, again, Christ floating down on a cloud. It means Christ nailed to a cross. Horrible, bloody, violent death. And that was a sacrifice for our sin, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Back to that sacrifice. Lay everything else aside as the hope of our salvation and we come to the foot of the cross. That was God's plan. But now we must receive God's plan and sacrifice. I've mentioned, I think I've mentioned that I've taught history. One of the interesting things that I've learned, I think it was the 1870s, there was a case that came up before the Supreme Court. A man that had been involved in a property and involved federal property and he was convicted someone was killed in the robbery and he was to be executed and someone convinced the president of the United States that that man should be spared and the president signed a document pardoning that man now they brought the document to the man and asked him to sign it so that he would not be executed. Do you know what? He refused to sign it. He said, I'm not going to sign that. I'm guilty, and I do deserve to be executed. Well, they had never had a case like that happen, so it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled, you cannot force a man to accept a pardon. And he was executed. <coughs> Now, let's think about that when God prepared a plan that says, you're pardoned. How many people did Jesus die for? Everyone. But he doesn't force you to accept the pardon. So we need to think about this. How do I go back to God's plan of salvation to receive it? To accept it? We must receive God's plan and that perfect sacrifice. And the first step is Romans 10, 17, which you're participating in right now. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now hearing there doesn't mean the vibration of our, our uh, eardrum. It means opening my heart to examine, to listen, to study, to investigate. When I taught school, not every student did that. Sometimes they go to sleep. So God is offering a plan, and He's asking me to open up my heart to examine this plan. What are the details? Learn about this. All right, next. 
open our hearts to believe the plan. John 3.16 said that God offered up Christ to save us, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. So who makes a decision whether I will believe in him? I have to make that decision. You have to make that decision. And God won't force you to make that decision. Am I convinced by the evidence or am I not convinced? All right. Next in God's plan is to open our hearts to repent. Jesus spoke of that many times. The apostles preached that in Acts 2.38. Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If I don't misread it, that's the hardest step. Hearing will challenge your curiosity, which is an enjoyable experience. Even coming to a point of saying, you know what, I think I can connect the dots and this is all true. That's not a high and hard mountain to climb. But repentance means I have to change my heart and attitude. Giving up the sins I have loved and practiced maybe for years and years. And that's the hard mountain to climb. But we must do it. That's how we accept the pardon. Then, Acts 8, 37, a man wanted to be baptized, and Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans 10 and other passages show that's necessary that we will open our mouths and confess Christ openly. Did you know there are people that would like to be a disciple of Christ, but secretly? They don't want that made public. There are no secret disciples. He was not secretly crucified. And we have to stay, uh, I meant to say stand, we have to stand without shame and confess, yes, I do believe He is the Son of God. Well, I don't know if I can do that. Well, you cannot accept your pardon until you do that. All right, what else? In that plan, the apostles preached, as in Acts 2, again, verse 38, that we must submit to Christ in water baptism. Repent and something. And a coordinating conjunction. It joins things of equal value. Repent and be baptized. Now who needs to do this? Every one of you. So no exception. This is how we receive the pardon in every case. Well who says that I have to do that? In the name of Jesus Christ. Alright? So by His authority, by His command. And then what is the purpose of doing it? For the remission of sin is like saying so that you will be pardoned. And then we have fellowship, even with the Holy Spirit. Fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because this is how God washes away our sins. <coughs> now, we're saved by obedient faith, and not by faith only. Coming out of the Protestant Reformation, there was a doctrine that people would be saved by faith only. It was an overreaction to the long years in which the Roman Catholic religion taught that you merit by your works. You gain merit with God, and that's how you receive salvation. And that is a false concept, and we did need to move away from that. But this is an overreaction by saying, the moment you believe, and by believing alone, that we're saved instantly. 2.24 said, you see then how that they work as the man is justified and not by faith only. Not by faith only. There must be obedient faith. So today, one of the most prevalent doctrines of nearly all preachers is that we're saved by faith alone. <coughs> they add the word alone. We read John 3.16, yes it's by faith, but you won't find that word only or alone in that passage. 
How many millions of people have heard the so-called sinner's prayer popularized by Billy Graham and by others? Dear Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I ask your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In your name, amen. No mention of being baptized for the remission of sins. Because it's following that approach that you were saved by faith alone, faith only. So I remind you, John, uh, James 2.24 said, not by faith only. So we need to be searching the scriptures and we need to make a decision. I want to go back to follow the Bible rather than to follow whether it be the Catholic theology or the Protestant Reformation teaching or any traditions that have been handed down to us of any kind. Back to the Bible. We're not saying that to insult people that hold different viewpoints. But what we are saying is we need a focus that will not change that we're going to go strictly by the Bible to receive our pardon. If we do this, we're going to go back to the New Testament church. We studied last night from Matthew 16, 18 to 19, the church that Jesus promised to build and he did build his church. I say unto thee, thou art Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So Jesus is promising to build his church, which is the kingdom of God, through the preaching of the apostles. Now, how many churches did he promise to build? How many? I will build my church. Singular, possessive. Christ has a church. But he has one church. And then how did he build it again? When he says, I'm giving you the keys, it means you will open the way. When he said, you will bind and loose those things that are bound and loosed in heaven, it means I will reveal to you the law, the guidance, the teaching of that kingdom. It's through the apostles' teaching. Now the next question would be, where can I find that church that Jesus built? You find it first in the scriptures. It's still there. It's still there. And then you find other people that are committed to follow the scriptures. And yes, we can be members of that same church today. <coughs> now, what did that church look like in Bible times so that we can go back to the Bible? The apostles reveal the right way to organize the church of Christ. It was done by gathering Christians into local churches and teaching the local churches to look directly to Christ. In Acts 14, 23, after Paul and Barnabas had traveled widely and established churches, baptizing people. They came back and visited those places again. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, every church had the same local form of organization and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. They appointed elders, mature men, who would lead in the local church. And they teach this local church to look to the Lord. It should occur to us they were not being taught to look to some human organization somewhere. Nothing said about that. There's a local organization, the local church. But there's no district, there's no diocese, there's no headquarters. But just look to the Lord in heaven but people sometimes have asked, how can that work? Well, it can work for this reason. The Lord has given the instructions in the Bible. If each local church will follow those instructions, who are we actually following? We're following the Lord himself. So we don't need more organization than that. 
I think I could make a simple illustration, especially for the sake of this congregation. You're in a period when you're looking to work with another evangelist full time. Who needs to make that decision? <coughs> Who can give you the guidance for that? Do you need an earthly headquarters to help you solve that? Do you need a supervisor that uh, travels around some district or diocese? Really, you don't. You need the Lord. Now, is the Lord going to name the name of the man? No, he's not going to do that. But look, if you open the Bible, it teaches you don't need a man that's an entertainer or necessarily an eloquent person, but a man that's focused on the same thing you're focused on is preaching the Word of God. And find out that he study and prepare himself to do that. You do that by letting him preach and by talking with him and asking questions. And you try to find out, is he living a Christian life? Is, is he with his original wife or is he with his third wife? In other words, you look for those signs of what is his commitment in a moral way. <coughs> and does the man show a good spirit that he wants to work with us and work with people? So all I'm saying is, you can make those decisions best at this local level. And that's the wisdom of God. The instructions and the guidance are in the Word of God. In 1 Corinthians 14, 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So the gathering of Christians into a local church with a local organization is the commandment of the Lord. And one other passage that helps us shed light on this. 1 Corinthians 4, 17. Paul said, He sent Timotheus to Corinth, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So in the Bible times, you don't find the apostles organizing a group of churches with a diocese and some other place that's a different form of organization. It's just local churches <coughs> every place. And teach them to develop mature leaders in the local church. Those are called elders. And you can read about having evangelists to work with those churches. All of the instructions are given. And if we follow that, we are that same church. All right, what does it mean to go back to God and back to the Bible? If there were no earthly headquarters when the apostles taught us, there should be none today. When the apostles taught, I meant to say in the first century, then the same teaching is for us. Where's the earth, earthly headquarters, headquarters of the Roman Catholic religion? And of course we know the place. It's in Rome, it's Vatican. How about the Mormon religion? Salt Lake City, Utah. What about the Tennessee Baptist Convention? That organization is in Nashville, Tennessee. What about the Presbyterian Church USA? It's in Louisville, Kentucky, the area where I live. What about the Jehovah's Witness religion, the Watchtower uh, Bible and Tract Society? That headquarters is in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Well, what about the United Pentecostal Church? The headquarters is in the St. Louis, Missouri area. Now again, I'm sharing information. I'm not trying to cast aspersions or insults. But here's what I want you to step back and realize. When you're reading your Bible, where was the headquarters? Was it Jerusalem? Was it Antioch? Was it Rome? There wasn't any such headquarters. So why do we need a headquarters? <coughs> we don't need a headquarters. We need to focus our faith directly to Christ in this local church, in every local church. <coughs> All right, what else do we learn? The apostles reveal the right work or the mission of the church. And that's an important concept. Many businesses and government agencies in recent years have adopted something that I think is useful. They post a mission statement. And the point of that is to get everybody that's working in that group on the same page about why we're here and what we're going to be doing. Did you know the New Testament gives a mission statement or explanation in the work of the church? 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, when Paul was writing about the elders, 
And he sent that letter to Timothy. He said, If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And then he said, The pillar and ground of the truth. He said, The purpose of the church, it needs elders, but the purpose of the church is to be the pillar and ground of the truth. Now think mission statement. A fire department has a mission statement. The McDonald's has a mission. The post office has a mission. All right? It's not the same mission. The Church of Christ in the Bible had a mission. Evangelism. Just what we're doing this week. And we're doing that throughout the year because that's your mission. In the Bible, they did not use gimmicks to get people to come. They did not organize sporting <laughs> events in the name of the church. No sporting teams, but sports were popular during that time. No gimmicks, just purely the gospel. All right, what else can we read about? We read about worshiping God. Worshiping in a way that builds our faith, edifies the saints. There's a summary of that in Acts 2.42. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Very simple and it's all spiritual in nature. There were no entertainment programs. No attempt to please people. They did not put on theatrical performances. But those were popular in those days. They didn't have concerts. They didn't do that. I want you to see, when they worshipped, they worshipped. And it was simply directed to the Lord. Now in that mission we find benevolence in emergency cases to help needy, faithful saints. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 discuss it. In chapter 9 verse 1 is touching the ministry to the saints. And whenever it discusses the use of the treasury for benevolence it will always say it is for Christians. They had no social gospel program to attract carnal minded people. We passed an advertisement today, a church had a soup kitchen. Well, helping people that are hungry is a good work, but it's just not the assignment of the Church of Christ. Putting out fires is a good work, but don't call the post office if you have a fire. It's a good work, but do you see those works need to be done in different ways? And so God did not create the Church of Christ to try to feed the whole world. That's not our mission. We need to stay on the right. Because this is the commandment of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 14, 37. And the apostles taught this everywhere in every church, 1 Corinthians 4, 17. We are trying to be that same church, right? So we're going to have that same mission. And that is how we can literally actually be the church of Christ today. One more thing, the apostles revealed the right way to worship. There is a true and right way to worship. In Acts 20, verse 7, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them, ready to depart on the morrow. They had a practice that every Sunday they observed the Lord's Supper. By and large, the religious bodies today do not recognize that. They do not practice that. When I was in the meeting in Michigan week before last, we had a first-time visitor. I think the man was in his 60s. And this is one of the things that opened his mind. He said, well, the churches I go to, we don't have the Lord's Supper just once in a while. And he could read the simplicity of this, that it was upon the first day of the week that the early church had the Lord's Supper. So this helps us to find God's pattern and the right way to worship. Next, think about this. How detailed the instructions are so that we know how to observe the Lord's Supper. Turn to Acts 26 just for a couple of moments and notice some things. In Acts 26, just before Jesus went to the cross. And he was making the appointment of the Lord's Supper for the first time. And he taught them to use unleavened bread and grape juice. Alright, beginning of the 17th verse. 
because they lived under the time of the law of Moses, they were going to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and they did that. Now look at verse 26. As they were eating, that means as they were completing that service, Jesus took bread. What kind of bread? Verse 17. All right, we know it's unleavened bread. He blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He had observed the Feast of Unleavened Bread before, but he had never done this before. Look at verse 27. He took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So you see, before he observed with them the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he said, that has come to an end, and I will be with you in a different kind of feast. Now just quickly notice this. What kind of bread, and then what kind of juice? In the Mormon religion, water and ordinary loaf bread. In the Quaker religion, there is no Lord's table at all. Oh. In the Catholic religion, the members eat the bread, and this has been the practice for thousands of years, and the priest drinks the cup, but not the members. So I want you to see that in the Bible, why are we preaching back to the Bible? We're not doing that to embarrass people or hurt somebody's feelings. We're trying to find our way back to God. And this is the Son of God telling us the right way to worship. We need to worship this way. We don't need to make changes. But we need to worship this way. Alright, notice. There was a collection every Sunday. It's written in God's book. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. Upon the first day of the week, that every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So every Sunday there was a collection. We know the New Testament church met at other times for Bible study and prayers and so on. But it never teaches that they took a collection on those occasions. But every Sunday there was a collection. How about today in the religious bodies? They have a collection every Sunday, but if they have a Monday night singing, there's another collection. If they have a Tuesday night prayer meeting, there's another collection. If they have a Wednesday night service, there's another collection. That's not the biblical pattern. We need to go back to the Bible, back to God, the original teaching of Jesus Christ. They prayed to God, Acts 2 and verse 42. We read that a moment ago. And they did not pray to dead saints. They did not pray to Mary. They did not pray to Paul or to Peter. But they prayed to God. Back to the Bible. And we should pray in that same way. There was the teaching of God's Word. Constant. Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's what we need to do in our preaching. That word was revealed to the apostles and now it has been recorded in this book. We need to do that kind of preaching. And then there was singing. In Ephesians 5 and verse 19, Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which Holy Spirit was sent by Christ, the head of the church, it said, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So the singing should be focused to please the Lord and serve the Lord and bring glory to Him. But it was singing. There were no instruments of music. There was no entertainment platform of any kind. They did not have choirs and solos. They did not have concerts. Well, they didn't have any flashing lights strobe lights, electronic mixers. I mean, the point I'm making, it was not an entertainment format. And I couldn't tell you the times I've had friends, and I'm trying to be a friend, and 
So we talk about the Bible together, and they would use expressions like, oh, we, we went to a certain church, and it was just really a praise day. And when you ask, well, what did they do? It's an entertainment program. That's not God's plan for our worship. Back to the Bible. Because these are the commandments of the Lord. There is a right way to worship. And Paul said he was teaching this everywhere, in every church. And we want to be that same church. And we can be. All right, I need to touch something before I close so that I do not leave a wrong impression. If we follow the things that we've been reading tonight, and we forget that back to the Bible means back to godly living, we are missing the boat. I want to read one passage on that, Titus 2, 11 to 14. We have been redeemed from our sins to live a new life. Titus 2, 11 to 14. I'm very much aware there are people who would react to a study like this, and sincerely they would say, but you're not preaching God's grace. Why do we have to strictly follow all of that? We should follow God's grace. Let's read a word of God's outrage. Titus 2, 11. For the grace of God, here is grace, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. So God's grace is not something outside the perimeter of Scripture. It's in the Scripture. The grace of God is what we've been reading tonight. But that's not all it teaches. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. You can well understand I might be baptized and continue my cursing like I did before. That won't fly with God. i got to wash my mouth out and change my habits. I've been gambling. I've been drinking. I've got to deny my ungodliness. I cannot say, oh, never mind the grace of God. We'll just take care of that. Well, the grace of God is telling me, stop doing that and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. He doesn't redeem us and then say, now my grace is so great, you just go ahead in your ungodly life. That's not the kind of salvation that he teaches but to purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Folks, it means if we're baptized into Christ, we've got to be committed to change our lives. Otherwise, we're not abiding in the grace of God. All right, and one more clarification that's extremely important. God's way of salvation and God's grace and love includes teaching us to go back to godly homes. And I want to read one passage on that. Colossians 3, 18 to 21. What is a godly home? What does God teach or what does He expect? He has defined our roles very clearly. And here's a summary. Colossians 3, 18. Wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. So I've been talking about how we obey the Lord, but look, a wife is going to obey the Lord by loving her husband, supporting her husband, letting her husband be the leader in her home, submitting to that leadership. Now a husband needs the advice and the counsel of a good wife. We're not saying that he's to be a dictator. But we are saying that a wife, to be a true Christian, will be submissive to the leadership of a husband. Next verse, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. So a husband doesn't need to be an iron-fisted dictator of some kind. But I need to be a loving leader and not bitter. You know what that one makes me think about? When we're courting her, she can't do anything wrong. We just open the doors and roll out the red carpet. Sometimes after we've been married for a few years, it seems like she can't do anything right. We become
become bitter toward her. We become super critical of the wife. And that's destructive to the relationship that God wants us to have. So we that are men need to correct those things as well. I need to be baptized into Christ, but I need to be the right kind of husband. Christ is teaching me to do that. Verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. So a young person who becomes a Christian needs to respect and obey their parents. That's part of being a Christian. And the last one said, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. I understand that verse well for this reason, if you'll excuse a personal illustration of what it's saying. In fact, when I grew up in a home where I was taught the Bible, but my father abused us as children, verbally, physically, and even sexually. And as a result, it bred bitterness, resentment, and rebellion. I had to struggle with that and try to overcome that. I have a brother that's ten times smarter than me. He's got three PhD degrees. Uh, he's a constitutional lawyer who specializes in the Second Amendment. He testifies before Congress. He has won cases at the Supreme Court. But he doesn't darken the door to worship. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. And so that falls on me because I'm a male and so I'm a father. I need to be a role model for my children. I need to do things that strengthen their faith and reinforce their faith, not things that discourage and destroy them. This is what it means to be a Christian. Back to the Bible. Fathers, let's go back to the Bible. John 17, let's study that prayer again and again. Jesus is praying that all men may know the truth and the way of salvation and be united in Him. He prayed for all who would believe through the Word. That Word of truth is the power that will save us and unite us with God and through that word, others will be brought to salvation. Back to the Bible, because it is the source of truth. Ultimately, standing behind the Bible, God is the source of truth. And so when we say back to the Bible, it literally means we're going back to God Himself. That's not legalism. That's not Bible idolatry. We're not making an idol out of this book but we're yielding our hearts to God and our lives. We're calling men back to the Bible even tonight. Sin and error, remember, constitute rebellion and an insult to God. It's a rejection of God and His truth. Christ came to restore us to God. We're the enemies of God in our sin. We're reconciled to God in Christ. And we've studied what it means to go back to God and back to the Bible. Back to that original plan of salvation, that original teaching about the church, that teaching about godly living, and what else? Our family life it needs to go back to the Bible. God is calling men today. If you need to answer that call, there may be some that are in the audience who have obeyed the gospel and then fell back into sin. A loving, patient God is waiting to receive you. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Come tonight and lay aside those sins. Let's pray together and be restored to your Lord. If you've never been baptized into Christ, we would preach the same gospel that Peter did on the day of Pentecost tonight. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you're outside of Christ, the door of mercy is open to you if you will submit to Him. Will you do that tonight? We invite you to come while we stand and sing this song. We shall sat in a few moments so that we can have a change from the pulpit format to a Bible class format, meaning we can open the floor if there are questions or something to be clarified or even something you did not agree with. Seriously, we're open to hear it. And we want to be fair and we want to
might be kind in giving you a Bible answer. Are there any questions tonight? Anyone would like to ask? Yeah, Ron, um, one of my persons that I work with, one of my supervisors, told me how where he read the Bible, the entire Bible, three times. And my question is, how can you help somebody? I mean, I read maybe one or three chapters and you feel your heart being free. Sure. How can you read the Bible three times? And all right, good, good point here. Uh, he's referring to the fact that sometimes we have friends who do read the Bible, but they may be living a life that's not right, or they may be in a false religion of some kind, and uh, how does this happen, and how can we help them? The first thing that would come to my mind is this is somewhat similar to Acts chapter 8 with Philip and the eunuch. Here's a man that was reading the Bible, but he was honest enough to say there are things here I don't understand and so he asked for help and of course Philip was able to answer his questions and that particular man was converted to Christ when a person has a searching heart they will encounter things and they will reach out to try to find help I'll give you an example that happened in the Philippine Islands when I was in a rather remote place just a small village in a little place where we were preaching and a man came down the dark road and just noticed that we had preaching. No one had invited him. Uh, he just decided to stop and see what's going on. I don't remember my subject, but I was explaining 1 Peter 3, 21. When the Bible said, the like figure wherein to baptism doth also now save us. And you remember the context that Noah and the seven with him in the ark were lifted by the water. And in that sense, they were saved by that water. And so when we submit to Christ in baptism, we are also saved. Well, the man heard that part of the lesson and decided he'd stay in there some more. And after we dismissed, it's time to go back to the city, to the hotel. He asked permission to ride in the van with us because he wanted to ask some things in the dialect, which I don't speak. So the preacher's with me discussed with him, and here's what I learned the next morning. He studied with them all night asking questions. And what started this ball rolling, he had read 1 Peter 3, 21 recently and took a day off from his job and contacted five denominational preachers to ask them to explain that verse. And he, he still struggled to clarify the verse but he could see they're all talking around the verse and they're trying to escape what it says. So here's a man like your friend that had been reading his Bible and yet there were things he didn't understand and he felt frustrated at the end of that. But when he passed by that day and heard the explanation of the passage, a light came on. He saw, yes, that's what that says and that generated then opening his mind to more questions that he, he wanted to ask more help. So where I'm going with this is not only the person needs to be reading the Bible, and this would apply to all of us too, we should have that searching heart that we're really looking for the truth. We're not just reading it out of habit or just reading it because my church has a reading program but we're reading with a heart to dig and learn and learn and dig. And when we do that, we're going to encounter things where we need help and we ask for that help. And one other thing that does help that you're doing and others here, you keep inviting those people to worship with us, <coughs> visit a meeting. They know you have an interest in their soul. And if the time comes, that those questions begin to percolate, who are they going to go to? Somebody that showed an interest in their soul. So keep doing it, keep doing it. Yes, please. I actually have two. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, it speaks of uh, why else are they baptized for the dead? Right. What are they talking about? It can be kind of confusing at that point when you read before and you get to that. Sure. What exactly are they talking about there? Okay, very good question. First Corinthians 15 and verse 29, 
Some of you are aware the Mormon Church uses this verse to teach that you can go to Salt Lake City, look up the records of your dead relatives, and then they will baptize you for your dead relatives. That's not what this is teaching. No one can be baptized into Christ unless he first opens his own heart, like we studied tonight, he will believe and repent and confess Christ. But now, what does it actually teach? You already know that the whole chapter is devoted to the resurrection. First, that Christ was resurrected, and he now has the power that he will also raise us. Now, he begins discussing way back in verse uh, 15 and 16 that if the dead rise not, that Christ is not raised, uh, in verse 21, since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. And so he's helping them to think about those that have already died and have died in Christ. Look at verse 23. Every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits. Afterwards they that are Christ. So we're talking about Christians. They that are Christ at his coming, that's when we will rise, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. So when you come to verse 29, I should have mentioned that in the 12th verse, there were people in this church teaching there is no resurrection. So he's trying to counter that. So in verse 29, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, now again, get back in the context. The dead who are Christ's. That's what he's been talking about. We are baptized because we want to be with those people. A brother just died today where I worship. Faithful man. Well, when I die, I want to be with him. Abraham's bosom. If the dead rise not at all, why, why are you baptized in the hope of being with the dead in Christ if the dead don't rise? That's how he's countering the ones who say there is no resurrection. If there's no resurrection, why are you being baptized? Of course, we could say, well, I'm baptized for remission of sin. Good point. But in the context, there are people who have already died in Christ. And we're baptized because we want to go down the road they went down to be with the Lord. So there's no need to be baptized if there is no resurrection of the dead. Why then are they baptized for the dead? The idea being the hope that they had when they died. And you see how that will fit the context. Go ahead, the other question. The, the second question is uh, when you pray for forgiveness, what is the difference between that and actually coming to court at the end of the service? Oh, good. good question. The two, because you're asking for forgiveness and you're coming to court. You're, and in a sense, you are repenting and you're seeing it either way. Right. So right. what is one versus the other, basically? Okay. We could go to several passages. Let's use this one in Matthew 18. When we invite people to come who have fallen away and to be restored, we're speaking primarily of people that have left the Lord, left the church, and they need to be restored. But there could be cases where we're still actively attending, but our life is not right. In some cases, my life is not right. Well, just like, I don't have any bitterness about this, I want you to understand it, but like my father, behind closed doors, we live in a very different world. He led singing, he would teach classes. He was a good man in that way, but behind closed doors, there were a lot of things he needed to correct. Now the church did not know about those things. So the correction he needed to make was with his family. If he wanted to ask the church to also pray, he could. But the problem is not with the church, it's with his family. So the passage that Clarify that in Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, that's a personal sin against just one, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, then thou hast gained thy brother. So I lost my temper and I cursed at you and I got ashamed of it. 
well, I need to go to you and make it right. But if I don't, you can approach me after I've cool, calmed down and try to help me make it right. And, and by the way, if I would make it right, I need to just say to you, I'm sorry, and let's pray, and please forgive me. There's no need to bring that before the church. They don't even know about it. Second step, if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So if you approached me in a good humble way and tried to help me correct it and I was stubborn, arrogant or something, you might again wait a little bit, let me cool down, and then bring a couple of brethren with you and try again. Now notice this. If that step convinced me, where do I need to make the confession? right in that same circle. Because those are the people that know about the sin. The church doesn't know about it. And then the third step, if he neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. So if the last resort, you would bring that matter before the church, and I still refuse to repent, the church is going to have to withdraw from me. Now the whole church knows. So when I repent, the whole church needs to know that. If I were just secretly repent, that's, that's not going to solve it. The whole church knows about that sin. So when sin has a public element to it, it in other words, it is or can be known in a public uh, setting, that's when we especially need to make a public confession. One more clarification. We can ask each other for prayers any time for any reason. I recently came before the church and asked this. I said, I'm now 73. I understand my life will finish its course. And I want you to just pray for me to be faithful to the end. I'm not conscious of any sin. But if there are sins, I need to get it corrected. You might be going through some health problems or financial crisis, you could ask the church to pray about that. So we could ask for any reason. But on the precise point that you're asking about, mainly the repentance and the confession needs to be among those who know what's happened. Good. We don't want to leave the impression, I'm glad he brought that so I can say this, we're not saying that the preacher is like a Catholic priest. You're not coming forward to confess to me or whoever is a preacher. That's simply a way to make a public statement of confession. Were there any others? Yes? I'm still pretty new to the church, and I, I know that you covered it about the lack of musical instruments. Right. Is there any other place that also says that within the New Testament. I'm not arguing with it. No, no, I'm I understand it, but I want to understand it more because my background was full of all of that. I and, I, and I appreciate what you said up there because you made some very powerful points that it's not supposed to be like a rock concert and a, you know, but I, I still want to understand why there are no actual instruments. Right. Good, good question. I think a simple way is to do it this way. When Noah built the ark, what kind of wood did he use? Hard stuff. It was really good. I can't help it. Somebody I'm else. sorry. Go for wood. Thank you. Okay. I just know it was All really right. hard. Now, think about this. I one time saw a display in an airport. I had no idea how many kinds of woods there are. There are multiple thousands by God saying go for wood, it automatically eliminated all of those thousands of others. The same principle that if you were to send your, say you had a son that was a teenager, and you send him to the store uh, to buy bread, you don't have to stop and say, I did not tell you to get ice cream, I did not tell you to get candy bars, I didn't. You don't have to do that. When you say bread, it automatically removes all the others. That's how language works. Now, in the Old Testament, God <laughs> commanded both singing and dancing. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with those passages. So, yes, sir. when you come to the New Testament, there are nine passages that address this. 
and every single one speaks of sing, sang, sung, uh, the fruit of the lips. It's uniform. Vocal music and instrumental music would be like gopher wood and pine wood. Another kind of wood, another kind of music. <clears throat> so if the Lord specifies the wood, there cannot be another kind. When the Lord specified the form of music is singing, we cannot add another kind. Okay. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Good. Thank you.